Good afternoon to everybody. Um, it's very nice to be able to join this uh, happy occasion. Um, I, first of all, I want to join everybody else in congratulating uh, Mayor. Um, uh, I was um, had the fortune. I was fortunate enough to read his his uh, book, and I think it's excellent. And since it's based on his PhD, I want of course uh, kudos to his advisors as well. And based on Mayer's insights and attempts to define uh, the Phoenician cultural identity, I wanted to move beyond Phoenicia and say and share some thoughts, deliberations, questions, doubts perhaps on the issues of relating to identity in archaeology and in general and in the Ar Iron Age Southern Levant. And um, for the last uh, close to 10 years, I've been uh, thinking and writing a lot about the issues of uh, identity in archaeology, starting from, um, from Philistine identity and, and how it's uh, reflected in the archaeological record and going farther. And, and to a large extent, I sort of feel that I'm sitting on a, on a branch in a tree and I'm slowly sawing away um, at the branch, uh, being on the wrong side. Uh, and in, a, um, in an article which is about to be published, which I'll, uh, I'm very, very uh, skeptical about a lot of the um, discussions on identity uh, on is early Israel in gen and specifically, but in general, I think I have finally um, cut the branch and I've fallen to the ground uh, very painfully. Um, and um, what I think... Uh, and I'm speaking, I'm, I think I'm speaking, castigating myself and, and many of us in the, in the field of archaeology is how we uh, deal with identity in the archaeological record. And uh, I'm not aiming it at Mayer, I'm aiming it at myself and all of us. And I think it's time to take a, a very, very um, um, strong view uh, on how we relate to identity in archaeology. And uh, I want to start with a couple of ver um, uh, issues uh, in general. So first of all, it's very important to remember that identity is not a thing. You don't have identity. You, your, your identity is a process that you're continuously going through. It's not a static thing. Um, and because of that, it's not something that one has, but it's something that one does. And that's a very, very important thing. Now. Um, when we start to talk about what identification is, it's important to remember that identification is an interaction between relationships of both similarity and of difference. And um, an individual and collective identity are as much an interactual product of external identification by others as of internal uh, self-identification. And it's wrong to put the emphasis on only one aspect and not the other. And most importantly, identity is not static. It's produced and reproduced and changed uh, in discourse and in very practical and often very material consequences of identification. Now, when we look at how identity is dealt with in archaeology, I think I can point out several issues, which I'm sure are not new for many of you, but nevertheless, I think it's very, very important to point them out. First of all, I think when we talk about identity, there's too much emphasis on ethnicity. Ethnicity is one type of identity. There are many other identities that groups have and, and, and people have. And it's important to re not to throw on the wayside all kinds of other types of identity, which perhaps have reflection in the archaeological uh, record. Um, I think many of us in a very, very, um, uh, it's, we come from our mother, uh, from our mother's milk, we're stuck in the so-called Kultur Kreislere paradigm. I'll talk about this in a moment, uh, which is a, um, a old, uh, more than a hundred years old paradigm, which I think we're very much stuck in it. And it's very comfortable to be there, but I think we have to be very aware of the problem. Um, Another issue is too many of us are unfamiliar with updated social theory on identity. We, we base what we write on this, on things that were written sometimes 10, 20, 30, or um, for example, um, the very often quoted 
text by Barth, Ethnic Groups and Boundaries, came out in 1969. And they, not too long ago, celebrated the 50th anniversary of its publication. And this is very often related to as more or less the final say on, on, on the matter and on ethnicity. And for example, the emphasis on borders. And we have to remember that things are developing and we have to be aware of them. And very often, um, you see people who quote the theory, but then practice the opposite. And this is something that we have to be very aware of. And, th and last on the, for this slide is this problem that we, that we turn to, and Mayer also talked about this in his book, there is basically a tyranny of the text. That means that we're so dependent on the text to define um, identity. Mama, mama, mama. That um, let's see, Rosanna, you're making noise here. Um, okay. Uh, um, um, okay, so there, Rosanna is off, thank you. Um, and general, and this, this tyranny of the text brings out is that on the one hand, when you have the text, it dictates our archeological understanding. And then um, when we don't have the text, we're, we sometimes flounder away without a, a clear direction. Now, what is this, um, when I talked about Kulturpreisler, uh, this is a um, concept which was developed by the, the famous or rather infamous uh, archeologist Gustav Kosina. Uh, Kosina, part of his, um, his general method of Seidlung's uh, archeology, span in which he tried to define how we can um, talk about um, uh, arche archeological evidence One second, is there a problem, Mayor? Can I go on? Mayor, can I go on? Yes, no problem. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Everybody hears me. Um, yeah. Uh, and basically, uh, he developed what's known as the Cosina Axiom, and which is translated into English, strictly outlined, sharply defined, bounded regions of archaeological culture, necessarily coincide with certain ethnic or tribal areas. Now, um, bluntly speaking, this is what is called the POTS equal peoples uh, approach. And even though this has been discussed extensively and shown to be outmoded, as we will see, many of us, and, and at times all of us are still very deeply in this approach um, when we deal with archaeological remains and the arche and, uh, and the and identity, and this is not only a problem in the Iron Age Levant, and I'm bringing here two examples from um, Iron Age and medieval Europe, uh, in which we're talking about um, uh, the the, con the problems of identity and the archaeological records, and we'll start with a. Uh, quote from Popa, um, if the scope of archaeological research is to obtain an insight into the identity constructions of Iron Age people, as suggested by the material evidence, then we need not to be fixed on one particular type of identity, which may or may not actually be present in the archaeological record. Rather, allow for all possible scenarios to unfold and pick the ones that seem most plausible. This implies a 180 degree turn in the relationship between identity concepts and the material record. One should not categorize the material record based on some large ethnic identities that we assume people share, but rather reconstruct past identities based on the material record patterns. Now, what this means is that we very often base these large ethnic identities on on, on textual sources. And if we move on to the next um, uh, quote, this is by Susan Hackenbeck, who discusses issues of identity in early medieval Europe. And she says, studies on, of ethnicity in the early medieval period have relied heavily on a literal reading of historical sources, creating a self-referencing circular argument. 
The sources are thought to provide a framework of facts and dates into which archaeological evidence can be fitted. Fragments of information gained from historical sources are taken out of context and used to identify the movements and settlement areas of, of the barbarian peoples. Distribution maps of specific artifact types then apparently identify these areas on the ground. The next step is to identify the ethnicity of individuals by making a connection between these artifacts and the identity of those who are buried with them. Once the tribal areas be, complicated, be populated with people, these people then turn fully clothed into the actors mentioned in the historical sources. And making a uh, scheme, which, uh, which ba is based on Hackenbeck's uh, scheme, um, you can look, you start with little reading of the historical sources, extrapolation of ethnic identities, interpretation of distribution maps to fit these ethnic territories, identification of artifacts as being ethnically significant, identification of ethnicity and individual, and the, 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 the and this circle goes on. Now, take this out of early medieval Europe, place this in the Iron Age Levant and biblical sources or other sources, this is exactly what we more or less are all doing all the time. And this is very problematic from, um, from many aspects. Um, now, if we go to the Iron Age Levant, so we very often have simplistic distinctions that we can identify large groups, Israelites, Judites, Phoenicians, uh, Philistines, etc. Um, very often in a simplistic manner, very often in a simplistic understanding of, of the relevant text, um, we, we map out very broad and very monolithic and at times static uh, situations. Um, we have unidimensional identity differentiation. That means we mainly talk about ethnic ethnicities or cultures. We very rarely deal with um, other aspects of identity. And of course, the overemphasis of biblical oriented paradigm. That means taking a text which is based on um, a, a collated edited text of, of, of sometimes portions are hundreds of years after the actual periods which they supposedly um, reflect and trying to interpret backwards using uh, materials that are clearly of ideological um, um, uh, origin. And we're basically using written sources in a very, very simplistic manner. So let's point out some important points. Material culture often does not equal identity. We have the habit of doing exactly the opposite, of assuming that it does. Um, by the way, again and again, um, studies have shown it's also for language. Language does not necessarily correlate with identity, not ethnicity and not others. Sometimes it does, often it doesn't. Um, identity in the archaeological remains is best seen not based on dispersal of certain objects, not based on maps, but through differences in praxis, and in particular technology. This is something that's coming out more and more in research, is very, very specific technological praxis on the day-to-day -day level within groups is perhaps one of the best ways to differentiate between groups. And why is this so? is because many of the things of daily praxis that people have in their groups are things that are learned from an early age and they become sort of an automatic aspect. And, when you, and through this, you can perhaps at times differentiate between groups, but you can use the same type of object in different groups and that same object can be made in the different groups using different technology. So, this is true for cooking, this is true for um, pottery production, and many other aspects uh, in daily life. Um, and one of the things that many peoples are talking, many uh, scholars are talking about in, in social theory is to start talking of communities of practice and communities of belonging within these small scale groups. And these perhaps are how we may be able to start getting an idea of identity 
in the archaeological record based on the, um, on the archaeological finds. Another very, very important aspect uh, to think about is what's known as nested identities, and that we all have many, many identities. Um, they're not all one in, in, within the other as the babushka dolls, but many of them overlap in different ways with different groups and peoples. But we have to always remember that we uh, have complex uh, nested identities in any group, in any person, in any culture, in any period. Um, and for example, and I've written about this several times, is there's been a lot of discussion um, in the Iron Age about can we define the various groups living in the uh, area between the southern coastal plain uh, or so-called Philistia through the Shvela, the Judean foothills, up into the highlands. And the, and the, the simplistic interpretation of this suggestion very often is the Philistines are here, including at Gap, where I work. Uh, in the middle, you have Canaanites. And in the highlands, you have the Judites and Israelites. And again and again, I've pointed out, and others have pointed out, that this is much more complex. And I've actually suggested, why aren't you moving, um, that perhaps we have to look at uh, a continuum. That means you don't necessarily have clear-cut borders. You don't necessarily have a situation where people know exactly who is where right up past a certain point. And there is a continuity and complex overlapping in the identities, the various types of identities that exist in, in this region. And this would go for ethnic identities and other identities as well. And another no less important aspect to remember is that while we very often look at these identities as very clear cut, um, they can be very shifting. And an example to this is um, political identities. And if we accept, as most um, um, social theorists believe, that almost all um, pre-modern societies are societies which have patron-client relationships, that means that you have a charismatic leader who controls or influences um, smaller scale leaders below him. And this is so for the Iron Age as well these small-scale leaders can shift uh, their allegiances over time. And the same group in one uh, year can be affiliated with Jerusalem and the next year being affiliated with Ashkelon, but still have, to, by and large, the same uh, material culture. And so this is another example of how these uh, aspects are complex. So if I may finish uh, this rather... Um, um, I would say problematic view of can we identify uh, identities in our archaeology? Let me say that first of all, I think it is possible. I think yes, but very cautiously, and I think we must be aware of more than one identity in any given situation. We must have a very broad range of criteria, both material and textual, to start talking about the various identities. It's constantly changing. Even if the material culture stays the same, it doesn't mean that the, identi the identity uh, has not. We have to start thinking in small scale of community of practice and communities of belonging. Technology, Shana Paratoire is a powerful tool. And most importantly, stop from bottom up and not from uh, uh, top down and start looking at the uh, differentiations between small groups and then start building uh, from there. And of course, be very uh, be, beware of the broad generations, which are often textually based, and of course, very often based on texts that are much later. So uh, I'm still trying to figure out my identity. And as I said, I cut the, um, the, the, the branch off. Thank you very much.